Good morning. My name is Joe Haynes. I'm the preaching elder at Beacon Church in Victoria, BC. It is Wednesday, June the 24th, and this is our morning devotional as we carry on looking today at Matthew chapter 24. Uh, so grab your Bibles and to open them with me and turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, we're going to look at verses 15 down through verse 21 today. Okay, Matthew chapter 24, uh, verses 15 through 21. Let's read that and then we'll pray. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in, the, in those days, Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. Let's pray. Father, I ask your blessing on this word this morning, that you would help us to see that, Lord, you love your chosen people. You have committed yourself in steadfast love and mercy and grace to those who believe in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, that this great word of warning here this morning would be heeded by us who believe in you today. That, Lord, even though it has been a long time since some of these events happened, that you would still hold before our eyes, Lord, the severity and the kindness of the Lord. That the severity of, of your justice, Lord, would keep us repentant, keep us serious about our sin, turning away from our sin and renewing our faith and dependence upon Jesus Christ trusting in him and the covenant of your grace in his blood that we lord would uh, praise you and worship you for your your great salvation through your own son our savior in jesus name amen matthew chapter 24 when we look at these verses especially starting in verse 15 there uh, and it says when you when you see uh, jesus is talking to his disciples who asked him the question in verse 3 when will these things be when will the temple be destroyed and, and they assume that along with that, that would be the end and the sort of the end of an, an old age and the beginning of a new age in which Jesus would reveal himself as the heir of David and the Messiah and, and rule. And they said, when will these things be? And Jesus here says in verse 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation. And it's interesting, you know, we, we have today in the church... Um, not Beacon Church exactly, but all over in, in the global church of Christ, we have so many teachers who uh, pride themselves on taking the Bible literally. And yet when they read these verses, they often miss that point and they assume that this is about Christians living in the end times where Jesus is specifically talking and addressing his followers in the first century. We see that because he says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing, there's spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. You know, most Christians today don't live in Judea. This is not a, a passage of prophecy that was intended to, the fulfillment would not be seen. It would, the fulfillment was never intended to be understood and applied as relevant uh, or directly relevant to the people living all over the world, but specifically relevant uh, to the Jewish people, followers of Christ, living in Judea at the time when these things happened. That's a that's a maybe a challenging thing for you to hear. Uh, but for for I mean, if you read the the sermons and commentaries by so many popular teachers today, and some that I love, uh, there the many good good men who are faithful and godly, and yet they kind of got tunnel vision when it comes to passages like this. And when we read this, it's maybe helpful to see what some scholars say. You know, there's a commentary. Uh, well, some have asked why, what led me to the view that I hold on this chapter. And I, I guess it's been a long journey. It started when I was a teenager with the writings of uh, men like uh, Henry Grattan Guinness and A.J. Gordon. Later on, A.B. Simpson. Uh, later on after that, I came across a commentary by Charles Spurgeon on these verses. Uh, I've looked at Matthew Poole, and, and these have influenced me and affected me. As time has gone on, I've seen that some of those things that, 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 they, um, that those old commentators talked about were more on the money than what a lot of teachers today have to say. 
Then I came across uh, years later a commentary by a uh, wonderful scholar, a New Testament scholar, uh, expert on the Gospel of Mark, who really pioneered so much new Christian understanding in the Gospel of Nar Mark, protecting Mark from the criticisms of very, very liberal scholarship. Um, and uh, this man, Dr. Larry Hurtado, uh, wrote a fantastic little commentary on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's called, it's by Baker Books, and it's called Understanding the Bible Commentary Series and the, his section on the, on the volume of the Gospel of Mark. I highly recommend it. It's, it's written in a way that uh, even if you don't have, um, um, you know, a degree in, in theology or you don't know uh, biblical Greek, it's okay. You, this commentary will be easy for you to understand. So the Larry Hurtado's The Gospel of Mark uh, in the Understanding the Bible Commentary series published by Baker Books. Highly recommend it. I think it was in the mid-80s that that commentary came out. Uh, Dr. Hurtado has a lot to say that just sheds light on the, the way a first century reader would understand these words of Jesus. And he's one of the best I've seen on this section. So I'm going to refer to him quite a bit today and just as we walk through some of these verses here. First we look at verse 15. And Dr. Hurtado points out that that term, the abomination of desolation, uh, would have been understood by Jews of the first century, uh, including the disciples, um, as a reference to anything profaning or destroying the temple in Jerusalem. But Mark's readers and Matthew's readers and Luke's readers, the gospel readers who read this, maybe weren't Jewish and didn't share that understanding of what was meant in that code word. And so there's different ways that the gospel writers refer to the abomination of desolation. So you'll notice here that, that Matthew says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand that that's a sign for the reader to go back and do some homework to see what does that mean the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place well in mark's gospel uh, where dr hurtado's commentary is really about mark's gospel in mark chapter 13 those parallel verses to these ones there mark says um, standing where it does not belong so when you see the abomination where it does not belong in mark 13 verse 14 in luke's gospel uh, Luke uh, sort of gets rid of the Jewish code word altogether and just says it like it is. He's not veiling it because Luke is not writing to a Jewish person. He's writing to Theophilus, a Greek person. And Luke chapter 21, verse 20, as Dr. Hurtado uh, points out, drops the code term altogether and openly refers to Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. And Hurtado says he is describing the siege as the time of punishment prophesied in the Old Testament. Let's see what Luke says. In Luke's Gospel, the parallel section to this one, Luke explains the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place in very simple terms, very straightforward language. Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 20, says this. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written, all that is written in the Old Testament. Luke carries on, as, or Jesus carries on in Luke chapter 20, 21. Alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. Those are Jesus' words in Luke chapter 21. What is he talking about? Wrath against this people, days of great distress, uh, days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. What is Jesus referring to? A reader of the Old Testament would understand that these prophecies, these days of vengeance, this time of wrath against this people, go back as far as Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy 28, the covenant curses that God warned Israel uh, that God warned against Israel that if they would disobey his covenant and reject his statutes and not walk with him, that he would eventually bring all these things upon them. So Leviticus 26 verse 27 begins this way. God is speaking through Moses. But if in spite of this you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I myself will discipline you sevenfold for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters, and I will destroy your high places, and cut down your incense altars, and cast your dead bodies upon the dead bodies of your idols, and my soul will abhor you. 
and I will lay waste cit your cities, and will make your sanctuaries desolate. And I will not smell your pleasing aromas, and I myself will devastate the land, so that your enemies who settle on it shall be appalled at it. And I will scatter you among the nations, and I will unsheath the sword after you, and your land shall be a desolation, and your cities shall be a waste. Those are the days of vengeance Jesus was warning about in Luke 21. That's the great dis distress upon this the earth and, and the wrath against this people that Jesus warned about. He's talking about the Jewish people and the destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus predicted in Matthew 24, verse 2. So when we get to, to uh, verses 16 to 20 here, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. The warning is for those Jews living in Judea at that time. He goes on, Jesus says in verse 17, Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Those are such difficult things. He goes on in verse 20 to say, uh, or verse 21, For then there will be great tribulation, such as, has, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No one never will be. Dr. Hurtado said in his commentary on the parallel section in Mark chapter 13, verse 20, uh, well, around these verses, he says, This language uh, of fleeing to the mountains and, and uh, do not you know go back into the house and let the one who is on the housetop don't even go get your cloak and all that language he says this language reflects life in Palestine of the first century uh, it's not for the modern modern Christians to watch for the Antichrist and run out of their houses when you see him this is this is this is about those people living in Judea literally around the city of Jerusalem in the first century um, he, Dr. Hurtado goes on, he says, the warnings are directed toward those who live in Judea. They are told to flee to the hill country, leaving Jerusalem instead of taking refuge in it. They are advised to flee quickly from the approaching army. There is uh, the, this touching note that Jesus makes here about the special hardships for women who are pregnant or nursing, and about how difficult the refugees will find it if they must flee into the hills in the winter. You see, uh, in, in, in uh, verse 21, um, Dr. Hurtado comments on this section Mark here, but in, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, Dr. Hurtado says, in addition to calling the coming destruction of Jerusalem by the prophetic term, the abomination that causes desolation, here it is described as an unparalleled disaster that will be mitigated only by the merciful hand of God. Look at verse 20 again. He says, G Jesus says, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. He's talking about the, ho the horror of desolation that begins with the destruction of Jerusalem. But I don't believe it ended with the destruction of Jerusalem. Here, uh, Jesus goes on to say in verse 22, and if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. For the sake of the elect. Who are the elect? In the Old Testament, the elect is frequent. The word elect is usually the chosen, is usually used about Israel. Uh, but not always. Uh, in, in the New Testament, it becomes very clear that the elect refers to the people of Christ whether Jew or Gentile, to, to Christians. And, for example, uh, Peter in 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, Paul says, I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Paul says that, for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Then Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses th beginning in verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? 
If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 11, Paul again writes, Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. Put on then as God's elect, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. These are God's elect, those who are forgiven by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, those who have faith in Christ, who are, are beloved by Christ, who, who, for whom nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. These are the elect. And Lord willing, in the days to come, in 2020 or 2021 or sometime very soon, we will live to see so many of God's chosen people in Israel come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so they, the chosen people will become again the elect through faith in Christ. That's my prayer. It's one of the great things of the end times I'm looking forward to, to seeing and rejoicing in as God's gospel grace and his kindness through the Savior Jesus Christ extends to more and more of the people of the Jewish um, Jewish descent. So as we get down to, to uh, um, Matthew chapter 24, and we see that, that Jesus is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century that happened in the year 70, as Jesus is predicting that, he is warning people when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Or as Luke put it, when you see the city of Jerusalem, that's the holy place there, surrounded by armies, then run from for the hills. Get out of your towns. Get out of the... Don't go to Jerusalem, but flee to the hills. As Dr. Hurtado said, when the Jewish revolt did break out and it became apparent that the Roman army would sweep away Jewish resistance from the main part of Palestine, Many Jews fled into Jerusalem for safety, probably assuming he said that God would not allow the holy city to be sacked again by the heathen. They fled the, this, the, the, their, their towns and fled into Jerusalem, exactly the opposite of what Jesus is saying to do, because Jerusalem would become like a cauldron in which they would suffer and die. Jesus said, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And Dr. Hurtado pointed out something that's often talked about by scholars on this passage, that there's an early tradition reported by the ancient writer Eusebius in his Ecclesiastical History, uh, uh, Volume 3, uh, 5.3, about, about the year 8300, uh, uh, Dr. Hurtado says. And this ancient tradition says that Christians living in Jerusalem fled the city to a town called Pella, east of the Jordan River, and that this action was taken in response to an oracle of God given to them before the war. What oracle of God? Well, it's this prophecy in, in, this, in this parallel passages in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, where Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, or when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, and they understood what that meant. When you see the Roman armies surround the city of Jerusalem and coming close to Jerusalem, flee. Don't go to Jerusalem like most people would. Get out of Jerusalem and flee for the hills. Dr. Hurtado goes on to say, Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, tells us that during the siege of Jerusalem, several rival groups with, with leaders claiming to be sent by God to deliver the people, they struggled with one another for control within the city. And it appears that many believed that God would do wonders to enable the inferior forces of the Jews to defeat the Romans. Dr. Hurtado says the revolt when it came was deeply motivated by religious feelings among the Jews. And in the light of the actual events of the war, Jesus commands here take on clearer significance. Basically, they warn against becoming involved in the war. 
recognizing that God will not defend the city of Jerusalem, but would allow it to be destroyed. And Jesus cautions that this destruction is not an immediate prelude to the end. It's not an immediate prelude to the end of the world and the beginning of the age to come, that there would be a long time left. So Mark, uh, Larry Hurtado says, Mark's readers were directed to understand that the fall of Jerusalem represented the judgment of God upon the temple and upon the religious leadership of Judaism for their disobedience to the word of Jesus Christ, especially for the rejection of God's son, Jesus. They were to see that it was no longer the temple that should be regarded as the center of God's attention, but rather the followers of Jesus, the elect that Jesus talked about. So what do we make of Jesus' words down in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21? For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. Dr. Hurtado writes, in light of modern events, such as the Second World War, uh, mass, the mass genocide of the Jews and the prospect of nuclear war, the description of the fall of Jerusalem seems somewhat exaggerated. And he says, but we must remember that these words were not were written for people who were expected to go through this trouble and that for them it was the worst thing that they would experience and could imagine. In the actual event, the war was quite costly. Hurtado points out, Josephus tells us that so many Jews were crucified that the hills were denuded of trees to provide the crosses. And here's the thing, though. We saw that Jesus accurately predicted the, the abominations of the Jewish people, the, the, the uh, rejection of Christ, and so the rejection of the gospel, the abomination that brought about the desolation Daniel had predicted, Moses had predicted. We saw that the, the destruction of Jerusalem, even, even including the, the cannibalism that took place there, fulfilled uh, the predictions that Moses uh, warned uh, in Leviticus 26, for example. We read about that in, jo in Josephus as he recorded the destruction of Jerusalem and the, the siege that took place there and how horrible it really was. And yes, it was intense. And yes, it was unlike anything that those people living at that time had ever experienced. But I think if we're going to take this prophecy literally, we have to read this as a bit more serious than just about the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days were cut short. I would argue that Jesus had a plan of salvation in mind for people who he had chosen, who had not yet heard the gospel and had not yet been saved, even from, for people among the people of the Jews. That Jesus has a gospel uh, mission in mind here. As he's saying, yes, there is going to be a tribulation like never before and never again. But at the same time, there's going to be gospel grace to many, many more elect. And so for the sake of those elect still to be born, still to come, that he had good things in store and would restrain uh, how serious the punishment of the Jews at that time was in the year 70. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm, I'm going to suggest that Jesus was not exaggerating when he said this was a tribulation like never before or never again, that he was not using hyperbole, but that the tribulation of the Jews that he predicted here was unlike anything the world had ever seen and would never or would ever see again. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to look at that and see not only the severity of God, but the kindness of God. And I hope that you'll join with me for that Friday morning or Thursday morning devotional <laughs> tomorrow. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this word of scripture and I ask that, Lord, you would keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, that we would let this uh, prophecy teach us, let your son's words teach us and instruct us, that we would put these things in perspective and not be looking for events that are not going to happen, but rather that we would understand what has happened and so be prepared for the events that still have, still have yet to take place, that we would have wisdom as we put our hopes in Jesus Christ, that, Lord, we would understand the warnings in Scripture are meant to turn us from our sin so that we are saved from a greater wrath that is to come, the wrath of hell upon those who reject Jesus Christ as Savior. We ask, Lord, for great mercy for the people of our time, that you would show grace and mercy by sending your gospel message to more and more people, that you would turn more and more people's hearts and minds to believe and to seriously consider the promises and the warnings of Jesus Christ, 
that, Lord, there is refuge and salvation in the name of Jesus, and there is hope and life in his name. I pray that in these days of 2020, more and more people will come to know Christ as Savior, so that your Son will be glorified, and that many will be saved and rejoice in him. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me today. I'll see you tomorrow. Until then, God bless.